Hello, Dan Guerra here from Vera Med. Today we're going to have a lecture that's going to be related to a question from one of our clients. So the way that Vera Med works is that we have a website and clients contact us with various questions related to biomedicine. We then consult with them by using the primary scientific literature and then suggest to them that they consult with their physician. And then with their physician, they discuss what is known in science about, let's say, given prescriptions or maybe some treatments that may be involved in their health and well being. So we work with the patient and with the physician. And the physician, of course, is the one that makes those final decisions. What we do, we're scientists, and what we do is we investigate that science and help support that interaction. So today, I'm going to give a talk that's going to be broken up into three parts, which will run uh, together. And this talk will basically be from a question from a client. We're going to answer that question, and we're going to answer it in three ways. One way is to a client that is a standard uh, client that would like to have information that's, that comes into, say, a clinic or into a pharmacy, wants to know something about a medication or a supplement or a nutrient or maybe a therapy such as a, a diet. Um, they consult with, say, a pharmacist. One of our uh, people in Vera Med, of course, is a practicing pharmacist. Um, we, will, we will then interact with that person, deal with their question, and then, of course, um, tell them that they need to talk to their physician about what we've discussed. So we're going to deal with that kind of client first. Then we're going to move into the same discussion, but we're going to be gearing it towards our next level of client. And that would be the graduate student, the medical student, the veterinary science student, um, someone that's in po graduate work close to getting their uh, doctorate degree. Um, then the third level, uh, of this talk will be for those that already have doctorate degrees or advanced degrees, such as law degrees, who already have quite a bit of experience and have a repertoire of understanding so that the terminology isn't difficult for them and we don't need to explain uh, at the level of terms um, what, where, we're, where we're going with the scientific literature. And of course, those people could be associated with uh, organizations such as hospitals or departments and clinics uh, as well as law firms, and we can interact directly with them under contract. So we're going to try to do all three of those levels in one talk, starting with your uh, general audience person and then moving through the advanced student, the postgraduate student, and then into the uh, professional clinician, physician, uh, scientist per personalities. Okay, so let's get started. So as I've said many times, what Veramed is, is that we're scientists. That's what we do. Uh, so we dig into the literature. I'm a lipid biochemist by training. I have background in plant, microbial, and animal physiology and biochemistry. I've been doing this kind of thing for over 30 years. And what I do basically is dig into the literature um, after a discussion with clients to figure out what it is they want to know in that literature and then bring it forward, look at the evidence in there, and verify that evidence along with them uh, via interlocution to figure out uh, what the science really does say about a given uh, therapy or a given drug or a given uh, associated metabolic pathway or physiological or pathophysiological response. So that's what, what I'm uh, 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 up to in these um, talks. I'm trying to get to the core of how we operate, and this will be one of those Vera meds where I'm going to deal with the question uh, that will be posed. So here was a client question. Do statins decrease testosterone levels? And a rejoinder to that is, would testosterone replacement therapy correct this loss? Okay, so it's a two-part question. So right away, I can tell you that after looking at the literature, which we're going to dig into in a moment here, that I can answer sort of without equivocation to both of those questions, uh, a pretty considered yes. Statins do seem to decrease testosterone levels, particularly in men. Uh, and indeed, with testosterone replacement therapy, you can increase that testosterone level, and there seems to be some benefit to that. Okay, so how do we get to those answers? Well, here's the verification part. Okay, here's a couple of papers I've looked at. I've looked at more than the ones I'm presenting here. For this client, we looked at several more, but I'm going to give you three exemplars. 
This paper was published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology, uh, oh, about four months ago. So I'm, I'm um, making this uh, seminar right now in April of 2017, mid-April. Okay. So you see the citation there. Now, what that paper showed is that reducing low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels with a statin, which is the target for statins, right, is associated with both a decrease in testosterone levels and, in this particular study, erectile dysfunction. Now, notice this was only with looking at 11 men who had uh, clinically LDL cholesterol levels that were um, indicative of hypercholesterolemia. So a uh, much, much smaller sample group than we normally like to see. But still, this was a controlled experiment because you had 15 controls. 15 controls meaning they did not have LDL cholesterol levels uh, that verified them to be uh, hypercholesterolemic. So what this study basically showed, without going through the data here for this talk, is that lowering LDL cholesterol levels with statins is correlated with lower testosterone. And because they used a survey, a gold standard survey for this particular study, the one that's the most bona fide uh, self-reporting survey for erectile dysfunction, they also were able to say that statin use and lowering of testosterone also had a negative impact on erectile function, therefore an increase in erectile dysfunction associated with, only correlated with, of course, the use of statins. Okay, so this was, again, fundamental question with a bonus uh, add-on about erectile dysfunction. Now, in another study, again, very recently published uh, five months ago, maybe six months ago, with a larger group of men, uh, 150, and now these people weren't diagnosed with low-density lipoprotein cholesterol levels that uh, earmarked them for hypercholesterolemia. These men had type 2 diabetes. Okay. They were diagnosed with that. So one of the statins reduced free testosterone levels indeed, but did not have a negative impact on sexual function. Now, okay, so that this now, of course, differs or is contradictory to the previous study that said that the surveyed men, uh, 11 men, said they did uh, experience uh, reduced uh, erectile function. Now, the difference between the two papers, first of all, these are diabetics, not hypercholesterolemics. So it's kind of an off-target thing to be taking statins anyways, because statins are really supposed to be lowering LDL cholesterol and don't really have a direct effect on type 2 diabetes. However, they're often prescribed. Now, there's that. Then, this is a baseline study, which simply means that you start off with a certain level of LDL cholesterol, a certain level of testosterone, a certain level of erectile function, and then you proceed to, to do the experiment, that is, uh, you, you're administering uh, the statin drug, and then you get an outcome. There are no control healthy subjects here. Okay, so that's a major problem with this particular paper. Likewise, I looked into the kind of survey um, that is the instrument that they use to determine erectile dysfunction, and it's a streamlined version. So there are two major uh, instruments for um, self-reported analysis of erectile function. One of them is the gold standard, um, which is much more thorough, much much longer, but tends to be supported by uh, the medical community as being the gold, gold standard. And then there's another one that comes out, which is much shorter, easier to answer, um, more easy to get compliance by the patients to fill it out. Um, but because of that, it probably suffers from uh, verification and accuracy. So those are three things that are different between these two studies. But you get the idea that Certainly, it does look like you get reduced testosterone levels, and whether or not you get the added uh, uh, negative effect of erectile dysfunction um, may be related either to diabetes or to maybe the actual instrument that's used to measure that. Or it could, in fact, be a biological occurrence that's just variable amongst uh, population. There's a third paper. So it's published in World Journal of Diabetes uh, very recently, about a month ago. Now, this is a much larger group. This is about some 857 diabetic men, again, diabetics. Um, they're break, broken up into three cohorts, so this is more of a randomized control trial, uh, and with crossovers. So how were they broken up? You had high testosterone, low testosterone. You had a men that were on a phosphodiesterase inhibitor or not. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors are things like Viagra, okay? 
or the active component in there, sildenafil. Uh, and then the third uh, cohort was whether or not they're on statins. Okay. So what are the upshot of the study? It turns out that statin use, the Viagra type PDEIs, the inhibitors of phosphodiesterase, which are Viagra active uh, uh, ther uh, therapies, pharmacotherapies, and TRT, that's testosterone replacement therapy, all looked at the endpoint for this study, uh, mortality. They reduced mortality independently. That is, they increased lifespan. Now, I thought this was interesting because I'm giving a series, an arc of lectures on aging. So this is really something that impacts a lot of biomedicine. So all three of these, statins, which of course are promoted by the medical community for cholesterolemia and lots of other diseases, and so are termed beneficial or deemed beneficial, uh, but not probably Viagra being one that's normally considered that way, and probably also not testosterone replacement therapy, which has some negative connotations in cancer research, and even maybe in cardiovascular. But in this study, okay, with diabetic men, all three of them independently seem to increase lifespan, that is to reduce mortality. And that was, they were independent variables. Each one of those three variables worked that way. Now, the beneficial effects of the testosterone replacement therapy was actually codependent on that stain, but statin treatment, meaning that in the absence of statins, there's no positive effect of testosterone on longevity. Okay, so that may suggest, it's only a suggestion, that lowering the LDLC with statins while decreasing testosterone may still improve longevity, but certainly that's not one of the major reasons for the study. Okay. Now, PDI alone, PDI, PDEI, that is the Viagra compound, and with other treatments significantly alter age-related mortality in diabetic men as they increase with age. Now, this is very interesting. It looks like age, therefore, plays a role in the positive benefit of the drugs. So the older these uh, gentlemen got, the older they were in the population, I think they, the mean age was about 65, but they were as, uh, as old as 80, um, the older they were in that cohort, the more positive effect you got from statins, uh, Viagra-type compound, as well as testosterone replacement therapy in association with those other two. That's very interesting. It means it's an age-dependent variable, which probably needs to be investigated uh, much more thoroughly. Okay, so that's the end of part one. That is the answer to our client's question. Uh, we, we prepare that as a written document with all of those citations. Uh, and also now I'm giving it as a, an oral presentation video. Now let's move on to the a second level, what we do at Bear of Med. So I'm gonna call this a detailed report on statins and testosterone, from after which I'm gonna just call it T. And this is geared more towards your graduate student or medical student and postdoc, beginning postdoc say in sciences, okay? Maybe a second year graduate student, maybe a second or third year medical student and, and a beginning postdoc. This is where we're going to be at with this so terminology. I'm going to be expecting is pretty common from amongst this group. So not need to, uh, to um, explain everything. Okay, here's our friend cholesterol. Remember that statins are supposed to be targeting cholesterologenesis, right? So there it is. It's a cyclopentanophenanthrene ring structure. And you see that in a whole host of organic molecules in humans. Of course, steroid hormones, mineral corticoids, and glucocorticoids come to mind first of all. So there is the compound. And cholesterol itself, while it's a precursor to all of those very important endocrine hormones, it is also, of course, a major player in membrane fluidity. It is, it is the reason why we have a fluid plasma membrane in animal cells. So cholesterol is a, an invention of an oxygenic environment in terms of molecular revolution. And because cholesterol is in the membrane, that membrane re remains fluid uh, and that fluidity then maintains all the properties of the membrane. That is signal transduction, uh, transport of ions, transport of uh, or organic molecules across the membrane, as well as all energy transduction. So cholesterol is really important in that outer barrier plasma membrane where it's most enriched. About 50% of the plasma membrane in most uh, cells in the body are actually uh, made of directly cholesterol. And of course, we synthesize this de novo. Can't leave it to chance and you only get that from diet, right? So now there are two really important uh, sex-based hormones, right? 
there's a female hormone, estradiol, shown there on the left, and then there's the male androgen known as testosterone. Now, what's interesting about these two, they both come from cholesterol, but the difference between testosterone and estradiol you see is very minimal in terms of its structure. In fact, you can see that the major difference is estradiol has an aromatic structure here, aromatic ring, right? A mesomeric aromatic ring, whereas you don't see that in this ring structure of testosterone. So the conversion of testosterone to estradiol is actually called an aromatase. It aromatizes that ring. And that one simple step goes from the male-based hormone, the dominant male sex hormone, which gives male secondary sector, uh, sexual characteristics, to the predominantly female sexual hormone, uh, steroid hormone, which gives female secondary sex characteristics, as well as reproductive capacity for both. Yes, it's pretty interesting. It's only differed by that aromatization of that ring. So here is the pathway. I'm going to look at this later, but I want to just give you an idea. It starts off, of course, with your basic two-carbon unit acetyl-CoA. Uh, this is a cytosolic biosynthetic pathway, but you start off with uh, hydroxymethylglutyryl-CoA, and boom, right away, so we're statins inhibit. Statins inhibit at HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting step for de novo cholesterologenesis. Okay? Now, that the product of that is mevalonic acid, and in fact, statins either are mimics of HMG-CoA, or of mevalonate, and that's why they inhibit this reaction. They basically act as competitive inhibitors. So once you make mevalonate, then you carry through a series of reactions to make the ice first isoprene lipid. This is isopentene pyrophosphate. And then from that dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate, and now you're deep into prenal lipid metabolism. Lipid metabolism is basically broken down into two main branches. Acyl lipids, that's fatty acids and things like phospholipids and galactolipids and sphingolipids, all those fatty acid metabolic pathways, tricyclosyl, diacyclosyl, things like that. And then you have prenal lipids, and that includes this humongous family here of cholesterol uh, uh, pathway derivatives. So it's all based on the structure of this uh, uh, isoprene, uh, uh, isopentyl pyrophosphate. Anyways, what you do during the biosynthetic pathway, now I want you to notice this, by the way, Making dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate allows you to make isopentanyl uh, adenosine transfer RNA. So without having uh, the production of this de novo, and of course this blocks this pathway, it only blocks it, it doesn't completely inhibit it, because completely inhibited would be lethal, right? Because it's an impeditive inhibitor, right? So enough substrate presumably could swamp out this uh, uh, inhibition. Um, but you need it to make this transfer RNA. So you can't get protein synthesis started without this dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. The point I just want to make about how critical cholesterologenesis is in all aspects of the cell and of human life. At any rate, if you condense the IPP with DMAPP, you make a 10 carbon compound called geraniol pyrophosphate. I know that you love these terms, I do. Uh, you add another C5 moiety, and now you're into the farnesyl pyrophosphate. This pyrophosphate moiety basically energizes this prenal lipid so that it can be used as a substrate for condensation reactions, addition reactions, things like that. Uh, and also it somewhat solubilizes it because this is a really uh, very hydrophobic lipid. Anyway, uh, once you make farnesyl, which is C15, it goes through these very important pathways, okay? You get farnesylated proteins, many proteins that you find embedded in the plasma membrane that act as signaling and receptor type proteins are farnesylated. So that's all part of the protein prenylation pathway named after the parent prenyl group. Uh, then you have this really important uh, isoprenal transferase reaction carrying down this pathway. You have the cholesterol pathway, okay? And you also have this uh, geranial geranilated protein pathway, okay? So geranial geranial pyrophosphate, that's C20, two C10s combined, okay? Uh, and you make that by adding another five to the 15 or by taking two tens, right? Um, this is another really important pathway. So you get farnesylated proteins, okay? And you also get this really important geranilated pathway, okay? Both of these things are really, really, really important. And as it turns out, and what we're gonna talk about subsequently, this geranil geranilation pathway, if it is blocked by statin use, because remember this whole pathway is gonna suffer 
with high levels of chronic statin use. Now, whether or not this has been thoroughly interrogated by the literature is certainly not um, well uh, founded. That is, if you look at the literature, there isn't enough yet on examining all these different biosynthetic pathways. However, if you do look at some of the core pathways, you'll note that the biosynthesis of coenzyme Q comes down this pathway. And coenzyme Q, okay, is actually suggested um, as part of the armamentarium for people on statins. So people take coenzyme Q supplements when they're on statins, precisely because it looks like coenzyme Q levels decrease because of chronic statin use. So already that's kind of in the literature. So statins are not a benign drug in that the heavy dosing of statins certainly can uh, impact this tremendously important biosynthetic pathway, right? So, and of course, just making cholesterol, membrane fluidity, uh, protein translation, uh, the uh, oxidative phosphorylation pathway, uh, preinylation uh, of proteins, either farnosylation or genogerinylation, all of these are very integral for life. So obviously these are not completely potently inhibited because you wouldn't get uh, any cells surviving that. So the key point here is that since statins do block the entire isoprenoid pathway way up here, rate limiting step, all of the key mediators of signaling can become deficient and therefore chronically disabled. Now, it's not saying they will, that's I, I said can, okay? And so the literature is still not quite thoroughly uh, interrogating this pathway, but it's something to keep in mind since the production and utilization of statins is a modern medical experiment. It's something that we've been doing only in this generation. So long-term chronic use of this and what may be imparting uh, either in the metabolic level or maybe in the uh, epigenetic level is still not worked out. Okay, so that's an important uh, point to bring up. There's a reaction uh, for us biochemists to show you HMG coli reductase. There's a reaction, notice it uses the reducing power of NADPH, which comes from uh, the exit pentose phosphate pathway. Okay. There's mevalonic acid, named for the pathway. Now also known as the mevalonic acid pathway. All right, so why do people take statins, right? Well, Way back in the 70s, the literature began to fill up with showing that hypercholesterolemia seemed to be associated with atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic plaques, therefore uh, providing for cardiovascular disease. Such things as heart failure and of course stroke are two major uh, complements of that pathophysiology. So where does this come from? Well, remember that cholesterologenesis, okay, is linked to lipoprotein metabolism. And know that lipoprotein metabolism starts off with chylomicrons, of course, in the intestine, but then the major players of circulating uh, lipoproteins that don't involve chylomicron or chylomicron remnants, which primarily contain triacylglycerol, are the very low density, intermediary density, and low density lipoproteins. These are three proteins, all with similar apolipoprotein backbones, which differ only in the amount of free fatty acid that's cleaved off by an enzyme that's peripheral in all cells called lipoprotein lipase. This is how you bring fatty acids to the periphery, such as, for example, skeletal muscle. It's gonna be really important here in a few minutes when we get to it. So as you enrich uh, from the VLDL, okay, notice VLDL is coming out of the liver, it's in circulation, you're meeting up with lipoprotein lipase, you're, you're enriching for cholesterol because you're removing fatty acid. What do lipoproteins have? Well, again, they're non-covalently associated protein lipid complexes that serve to carry hydrophobic compounds, that is lipids, in the blood, which is an aqueous compartment. So that's what lipoproteins are functioning as. These are not covalently uh, associated lipids with proteins. So they're not proteolipids, they're lipoproteins, right? Non-covalent association, primarily via hydrophobic interaction. At any rate, as you mature from the very low density lipoprotein uh, to the intermediary or IDL to the v LDL, you're enriching for cholesterol. So in the normal state, in the normal physiological state, the IDL and LDL dock to LDL receptors. The LDL are then in the liver takes back the excess LDL from the bloodstream and takes it in endocytosis, it breaks it back down to apolipoproteins and stores a little bit of remaining cholesterol. 
Now, in a normal diet, in a normal healthy individual, you're not going to have a whole lot of this LDL coming in. The problem is, is when you have too much of it. So let's take a look at a couple of pathologies, and this maybe will bring it all together for you. In familial hypercholesterolemia, the problem basically is not diet, and it's not fatty acid metabolism, and it's not even isoprenoid metabolism, that is cholesterologenesis. Um, it's really because uh, you don't have any LDL receptors. So LDL receptor synthesis is uh, deficient in, famili- in, in the classic familial hypercholesterolemia. So because you don't have a lot of LDLR in the uh, hepatic tissues, you can't take up that IDL and LDL. Now, what's the real problem here? Okay, the, the knee jerk from the hip sort of response as well, cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. First of all, I want to disabuse you of that uh, error. It's not cholesterol that causes atherosclerosis. It's oxysterol. Oxysterol, for example, being generated and stored in macrophages, macrophages which then uh, invade epithelial cells like in cardiac muscle that then bestow upon that cardiac muscle tissue macrophages chocked full of oxysterols, which can then generate or transform into foam cells, right? That's your classic atherosclerosis pathway. So I know that oxysterols sound a lot like sterols, and of course, cholesterol is a sterol. But the important point here is that cholesterol itself is not the mediator of the bad news. Cholesterol is something absolutely vital to the human body, right? Membrane, lipid, I told you 50% of all plasma membrane in the human is actually cholesterol, right? Not its derivatives. But then it's also the precursor to all those other things like uh, mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and the sex hormones. Obviously, it's pretty important. At any rate, what's this deal about oxysterols? Oxysterols build up because when you have a lot of IDL and in fact, even some VLDL and certainly LDL, okay, the LDL here, um, you have in circulation, it's exposed to molecular oxygen because the blood is really high in molecular oxygen, right? So because of molecular oxygen being there, because molecular oxygen is a biradical, has two unpaired electrons, you can oxidize quite well compounds that have the kind of structure that cholesterol has, okay? And that's exactly what happens. You oxidize that cholesterol, and then it's the oxysterol, okay? It's the oxysterol in the LDL which then gets brought into say, macrophages, which then bring it bring into tissues, which then cause foam cells, which then can lead to atherosclerotic plaque, okay? So it's the residence time, it's the residence time of these lipoproteins in the serum. And you're gonna get higher residence time in given pathological states, such as what? Such as obesity, such as type two diabetes, such as any form of hypercholesterolemia, okay? So high levels of cholesterol can, can induce this uh, problem. Okay. So there's where we are there. Now that's similar to, but you can see the, even though you have a similar outcome, the etiology of high cholesterol diet is totally different. Here, the argument is if you have a lot of cholesterol on the diet, you're bringing in a lot of cholesterol from the chylomicron, the digestion of the lipid in the, uh, mesentery brought back into the liver. When you bring a lot of cholesterol in, what happens is that you load a lot out You load out so much cholesterol to this pathway that you overload the system. You have a lot of cholesterol in the lipoprotein fraction, okay? A lot of cholesterol in lipoprotein fraction means what? More oxysterol synthesis, more oxysterol synthesis, you get the atherosclerotic plaque. So that's the concept there, that high cholesterol diet then kind of mimics the familial hypercholesterolemia, but for totally different reasons. Here you have plenty of LDR LDR receptor, although what happens over time, right? What happens with any receptor mediated in cytosis? The receptor gets overloaded and the receptor itself, the protein itself gets endocytose back in. Why? Because the liver is overloaded with cholesterol. So what is the, the feedback mechanism? What's the feedback for all this? What's the endpoint? Shut down the introduction of cholesterol into that liver. You don't want a lot of cholesterol in the liver. You're gonna get a fatty liver, right? So the liver doesn't want any more cholesterol, so it brings back in the LDL receptor, doesn't make new LDL receptor, which is actually regulated by cholesterol and by prenolipids and oxysterols indeed. So because of that, you get less hepatic LDLR in the surface, you get at less LDL taken up by the liver that enhances the amount of LDL in circulation and you're back to getting this oxysterols and the potentiation of atherosclerosis. 
All right. Here are some of the structures we're talking about. Um, you see they look a little bit like your HMG-CoA or like this is, uh, this is mevalonic acid. So there are four major um, statins, right? Here, Lipitor is probably the most common that gets prescribed still. So again, part of their moiety is gives them comp competition for uh, that enzyme, the HMG-CoA reductase. You see here, this looks like a little bit like HMG-CoA. This looks a little bit like mevalonic acid, right? So um, the substrate coming in or the product leaving. Competitive inhibition, unusual partial agonizing uh, competitive inhibition. So here's the pathway leading from cholesterol. So once you've made it or ingested it, what happens is you go through these three pathways, right? You either make the cortical steroids, the mineral steroids, uh, or you make the sex hormones. So there's testosterone, estradiol, there's cortisol, and there's aldosterone. So this is all linked up to kidney, glomerular flow rate, the aldosterone, the whole, the renin whole pathway that deals with uh, um, potentiation during chronic kidney disease, which is of course associated with obesity and uh, type two diabetes. Um, you've got the corticosteroids, which of course, normally what do they do? Well, they enhance gluconeogenesis in the liver and they also help break down glycogen in the periphery, all right? So that's what, uh, but they're also of course, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, right? Okay. And then of course we have the uh, big players there, androgens and estrogens uh, over there on that sequence of events. All right. So let's, let's ask a few questions about testosterone, and then we'll move on. What about serum testosterone? And then this list, we always keep in the back of the mind, we're talking about statin use. When people age, men, because testosterone is a major androgen, right? When men age, testosterone levels tank out, okay? That, at, and then that, that generates a lot of questions. Lowering testosterone, does that decrease muscle mass? Does that decrease cognition? There's some papers in neuropsychiatric journals about that. Does that decrease physical stamina? Does that decrease energy, overall energy? Does that cause reproductive decline? And indeed, is this associated with sexual performance decline vis-a-vis -vis erectile dysfunction, which is only one parameter of that, of course. So since you already have lower levels of testosterone, testosterone as men age. So the actual biogenesis of testosterone decreases. Actually, it's not just the synthesis from cholesterol. It's actually, you get an increase in the conversion of estradiol in men, okay? So more estradiol is produced in testo from testosterone in men as they age, still effectively lowering T, right? Uh, and T does have all these uh, positive benefits, not only in men, but also in women. So women also produce testosterone and women sometimes will uh, take uh, testosterone uh, supplements and therapy, particularly uh, athletes, uh, bodybuilders, female bodybuilders, because it does increase muscle mass uh, and physical stamina. Again, the cognition is, you know, th there, there are papers out there about this, mostly in animal models, but there might be something there too. Okay. So in general, statins are going to diminish T levels on top of the fact that as men age anyways, T levels are tanking. So it's a double hit in the negative, right? You're decreasing testosterone because you're getting older. You're, and if you're taking statins, you're decreasing it even more. So those kind of people can get very low levels of testosterone. Might add that hypogonadism in men, those young men, is directly linked to low T. Okay, so testosterone replacement therapy is really important hypogonadism. And sometimes it's given to men later in life because they suffer from similar issues. All right. <laughs> so, you know, this testosterone is an androgen. It's made in the testes and the adrenals, uh, much less than the adrenals. Uh, what they do at the beginning of uh, sexual differentiation is they enhance sexual differentiation to the male. Um, they also generate secondary sex characteristics, facial hair, uh, muscle development, that kind of thing. Um, ovaries and testes both produce androgens, as we said, women also produce testosterone. But uh, testes just produce a whole lot more, and basically they are the male sex hormone. Uh, all steroids uh, that you just saw a few slides back definitely come from cholesterol. And the most common androgen, of course, is testosterone. Okay. So there they are. They're the big three. There's testosterone, beta estradiol, and there's progesterone. All of these come from cholesterol metabolism. Okay. Again, very important endocrine hormones on their own, in their own right. Again, there's the aromatization directly from testosterone.
Pretty amazing. So what happens when you treat elderly men with testosterone? Okay. So here's a study that was done just about a year ago. They, they were looking at uh, sexual function, physical function, and vitality. Vitality is more like just energy, right? How much energy a person has. That's what they mean by vitality. So they got participants uh, that were already healthy. So they were pre-screened for being healthy. They didn't have any diseases or debilitating issues. Uh, and the eligibility criteria for these folks, again, they had to be 65 years old. And they had to have low T. Okay, so the low T here is below 275 nanogram. Okay, per deciliter, of course. They use this thing called androgel. Now, I've talked about this before in a previous bear of meds. So if this looks familiar to, use it, to you that follow me all the time, you've seen some of this already. But I'm bringing it here because we're talking testosterone, right? So they used an androgel, androgel in this paper, but they also used a placebo, which tasted the same, and they had the same textile characteristics, so people could, could be fooled, right? Uh, they measured testosterone all the way out past nine months, and they dose-adjusted it so that they wanted the, the people that were getting the T to have T levels like young men do, between the ages of, say, 20 and 40. What they found, they looked at these three parameters here, their sexual activity. Boy, it looks like it did enhance sexual activity by getting T. Doesn't look like it really had much to do with physical, the walking ability. There's nothing really there. Maybe later on there's some difference there. And overall energy, or what they call vitality, also did not seem to be positively impacted by T in this one study. Okay, So clearly some T seems to have some beneficial effect. And again, this is somewhat uh, of a subjective understanding. Of course, all knowledge is subjective ultimately, but it looks like this is a pretty whopping increase in sexual activity for these folks taking this testosterone. So maybe there's something there. All right, other studies that were looked at, uh, you can see the citations here. They're all published very recently. Testosterone supplementation, glucocorticoid, right? Milieu and bone homeostasis. In aging, they saw a positive effect throughout that needs a follow-up. Here they looked at this Fengu Creek seed extract. So the, the people who published this paper, first of all, there were no real controls here, okay? Um, like, so the experimental design on this paper was kind of flawed. Secondarily, there was probably bias in this paper because the people that were fund, doing the work were funded by a Fengu Creek seed extract firm, okay? So it doesn't mean that it's not accurate or honest data, but you have to take that in mind. But anyways, they claimed uh, they got elevated testosterone from this seed extract. Boy, they got higher sperm profile, more vi vital sperm, viable sperm. They claimed they got better alertness. They claimed better cardiovascular tone. They just look fantastic. Again, take this with a grain of salt or maybe with Bengal Creek seed extract, not. All right. Uh, third paper that, you know, again, briefly, testosterone replacement in the infertile man. This is hypogonadic or people that are generally infertile. Uh, this isn't a direct T treatment. What they did here is they inhibited estrogen receptors. Remember how estrogen is, uh, estradiol is the product of testosterone aromatization. So if you inhibit the receptor, you build up estradiol, you block the aromatase back to feedback inhibition. I know you folks heard of this many times. Uh, also, there are inhibitors of aromatase. That tended to boost T, and they did see some restored fertility in this population of men who had infertility for various reasons. Some of this hypogonadism. Again, it needs follow-up. Uh, fourth paper I just briefly looked at, testosterone supplement in older guys uh, for up to, what, three years is this? Yielded a modest improvement in muscle mass and power. Okay, so again, uh, that needs follow-up. There's a, there's a paper, when you go out and you look at the literature, you see a lot of this sort of I almost call it a physiological anecdote, right? But it's there. And these studies are not done with uh, uh, poor conditions or with poor experimental design. They're done pretty well. And they're with humans. Again, not mice, rats, or C. elegans or something. Well, C. elegans probably wouldn't work here anyway. But anyway, um, last paper, a British Medical Journal. Just now This is a review article. And it really, I really suggest if you want to look at a review article recently published, okay, it's very old, year and a half now, I guess. They claim that for low T people, that supplementing with testosterone, boy, they just couldn't prove that it had any positive effect. They're talking statistical effect, they're talking meta-analysis. So you need to read that paper, you need to carefully take a look and analyze that uh, and uh, come up with maybe some better uh, understanding of what's being said there. But overall, it doesn't look like T supplementation 
um, at least seem to have a positive effect for people that are chronically low T. Now, there's a lot of good metabolic, molecular, biochemical reasons why adding T to a naturally occurring low T population may not have the beneficial or desired effect. And that might have to do with receptors, right? So if you don't have enough T receptors, then you're not going to get the effect. All right. So now we're on to the third part of the talk, what I'm calling the advanced. I'm saying there are clinical implications, but I'm not doing a clinical case study here. That would be number four. I'm not doing a number four today. But the fourth level of discussing uh, things with Varev Med would be we do a clinical case analysis, and there's a lot of those published. We would dig into those with great um, depth and with great enjoyment and see what's there in terms of um, useful gain in terms of understanding the evidence and verifying it or not. But what I'm going to do here is get into real more uh, nitty-gritty, higher-level research in statin use, and I'm going to key in on just one paper, okay? Uh, this paper has implications for metabolic disorders, which are linked to obesity. So type 2 diabetes, uh, hypercholesterolemia may be associated with, cardiovascular disease, even cancer, okay? And it's linked to glucose utilization and skeletal muscle. I know this might sound like a far reach, but it's not, okay? Because remember, skeletal muscle is a major reservoir, right, for all of metabolic homeostasis, right? Because where's, um, where's your major deposition of glucose, right? It's going to be in skeletal muscle, right? Uh, adipose as well. And the adipose and skeletal muscle are communicated with one another because fatty acids also are being translocated and dropped off into skeletal muscle as well as cardiac muscle, as well as adipose, right? So they're all homeostatically conjoined and axial. All right. So we're going to look at this paper. A RAB GTPase activating protein is involved in the regulation of fatty acid oxidation in skeletal muscle. Again, this was published uh, relatively recently, I guess it's three years now, in American Journal of Physiology. Okay, and there's your citation. So what are we talking about here? Why is this linked to statins and lipids and the whole bit? Okay, let's go down here. Muscle is one of those cell types that you get insulin-dependent glucose uptake. So you get insulin-dependent glucose uptake in adipose, major depot for glucose and lipids, you get insulin-dependent glucose uptake in muscle, another major depot, therefore homeostatic for the entire body. So what's insulin doing here? Yeah, it binds its receptor, turns on the IRS, that's the insulin response substrate. Then it induces by associating with uh, phosphatidylinositol 13 kinase, making the trisphosphorylated phosphatidylinositol, which then turns on protein kinase K, which then activates AKT. This is all in some cells actually promotive of biosynthesis, that is protein synthesis. Okay, so mTOR is not here, but this is another mTOR sort of uh, signaling pathway. I'm just not showing it here. This is skeletal muscle. What that does, once AKT comes on, it phosphorylates this protein here, AS160, which then controls the Rab protein. So there's Rab GTP, that's your active form, and there's Rab GDP, which is your reservoir form. So this is going to regulate the synthesis of Rab GDP, which then okay, can be used as substrate to make Rab GTP via an exchange factor, which clips out GDP and adds GTP, and then boom, look what happens. It takes a GLUT4, GLUT4 is a glucose transporter common in skeletal muscle that's associated with vesicles in the cell, and it moves them. So the Rab GTP protein acts like, kind of like a molecular motor, and it causes this translocation of these GSVs, these vesicles. These cylinders here are the GLUT4, and they either fuse directly to the plasma membrane, where they act as monomers, where they're kind of like poor uh, uh, translocators of glucose, but then they can be transformed because of interactions in the lipid membrane and adapter molecules, both lipids and proteins, to form this highly active GLUT4 cluster. Now, you can make the GLUT4 uh, cu uh, cluster in situ in the membrane because of membrane dynamics and protein dynamics, or you can get this fusion directly of this vesicle, and when that happens, it carries everything with it, the whole package is there, and you make the GLUT4 cluster because you're already carrying multiple GLUT4 polypeptides. This is the protein moiety and the translocator that will transport glucose into the muscle cell. This is really important. Lots of reasons. Glucose, 
right? You have glucose oxidation in the muscle, very important for muscle contraction. In fact, there are two basic kinds of muscular activity. There's glucose oxidation. I'm talking from the biofuel perspective here. And then there's what? Fatty acid oxidation. Fatty acid is the tried and true, hey, the muscle's always got to be toned. It's always got to be ready to do something. It's got to be active when it needs to be. It's also for endurance, right? Because fatty acids, you can store a lot. You get a lot more ATP from fatty acids than you do from sugars, et cetera, et cetera. But as it turns out, the muscle fibers sort of disassociate. Uh, one going down the glucose oxidation, which means less mitochondria. So the gene expression to make mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation, for fatty acid beta oxidation, for fatty acid uptake in those muscle fibers is diminished. Whereas then there are muscle fibers that are directly for the fast twitch, glucose, less mitochondria, glucose oxidation, making glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, going through glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase pathway, getting only basically two ATPs via NADH, that pathway. But again, this is for your fast running or sprint runner. This is for your fight or flee. This is for having energy when you need it now, right? Because glucose is soluble. You don't need translocation. Lipids are slow and steady. Glucose is fast and furious, right? All right. So anyways, this is all regulated. As you see, there's insulin dependence, which is interesting because you know the diabetics have a problem with insulin resistance, right? So something's going on here in the skeletal muscle where this isn't working correctly. And believe me, it's been well interrogated, as I'm sure many of you know. Is it the IRS? Is it the receptors? Yeah, sometimes it's the PI3 kinase. Yes, sometimes it's the AKT. Yes, sometimes. Is it the AS160? Yes, sometimes. Is it the RAB protein? We're looking at that now. Okay. RAB protein is your ultimate liquidator of the movement of this vesicle. So it's pretty important, right? Yeah. Anyways, what happens when you use this cluster and you lower the level of glucose in circulation, it gets endocytose back, makes an endosome, and then it can be resorted reallocated to make a fresh vesicle and back out it goes upon induction of insulin. So this is your feedback pathway going back down, okay? So you can sort back directly to making this vesicle and be stored there until you get enough glucose. More glucose in serum, you need more glue transporter, boom, 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 it comes back up, insulin dependent. Okay. So there's your pathway. Now, what about RabGTPase? RabGTPase is a huge family of GTPase proteins. Okay. We're just looking at one small parameter here. But you need to know that this Rab GTPase is important for membrane trafficking between organelles. What organelles? Endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, nuclear envelope, um, mitochondrial membrane, uh, peroxisomal membrane. So you get membrane-membrane interaction, and it requires these Rab GTPase molecular motors, I call them. It, it causes a lot of uh, molecular fluidity changes in the membrane lipid, membrane lipid protein environment, and in so doing changes leaflet orientation, phospholipid orientation, and causes the membrane dynamics is necessary for vital communication between endogenous endomembranes. Okay, so RabGTP is a super important protein. And sometimes, of course, it can go awry. So let's take a look at this. So the traffic in between one membrane and another, you need RabGTP. It's absolutely essential. Without it, it doesn't work. And what does it do? It ensures not only that it works correctly, it also ensures how much activity occurs and when, how, where, and why it occurs, right? So it adds specificity because it's a family of proteins, okay? And they have co-adapter proteins and molecules that are necessary for Rab GTPase to exist in some subcellular component or another. The inner leaf of the ER, the outer leaf of the ER, the cis or trans Golgi, you get it. The inner mitochondrial, outer mitochondrial membrane, the peroxisome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, plasma. Okay. So they, comp they control membrane identity because they're also co-integrated in membrane biogenesis and turnover. Remember, that is the, the lipid moieties and the protein moieties because they're involved in vesicle, but vesicle budding from things like the ER and the Golgi. And of course, in so doing, they recruit kinases and phosphatases so they can sequester them, so they can shut down or they can slow down or they can make occult your normal phosphor, uh, phosphorylation cascades, including PA3 kinase cascades, by hiding kinases and phosphatases by being, by being held in vesicles, or they can transport those proteins to other subset of the compartments where they can be more potent and positively effective or negatively impacted by being translocated areas where there's no substrate. So there's a great deal of crosstalk between multiple Rab GTPases and that, again, ensures a spatial temporal regulation of signaling and trafficking. Okay, so both things. Yes or no, the valence, 
and where it goes, right? So very, very important and critical, right, these GTPases. And it's a temporal signature because you have to be able to cycle around, cycle around, like we just saw with the glute four. So when you have a functional corruption of RAB, what do you think happens? Holy smokes, all kinds of bad things. What are some major things in pathophysiology and disease? Immunodeficiency linked to this, lots of forms of cancer, and lots of forms of neuropathology. And by that, do I mean the big ones, AD, Alzheimer's disease? Yes, Parkinson's disease, yes. These are associated with that. Only, again, this is going to be an intracellular phenomenon. So you don't hear about these, but they're involved. And sometimes there are mutations in them. I was going to show you real briefly. This comes from a plus one paper. I just want to show you this uh, geronial geronilation. So finally, we're getting back to this, right? <laughs> so these RAB GTP aces, they need to be geronial geronilated. No, I'm not saying it twice because I don't know what I'm saying. It's because that's what they call the C20 moiety, geronial geronial. Okay, sorry, I didn't make it up. I still think it's okay. Uh, anyway, you need to add that C20 moiety to get these RAB GTP aces into the right plasma membrane association, right? To get them to function, to do things like to get those vesicles to traffic the GLUT4 to the membrane, okay? So without that geronal geronilation, these complexes don't cohere with all of these cofactor proteins. They can't get the exchange factor going, and they can't take GDP and swap it out with GTP. They can't fire whatever it is that they're going to be doing with the plasma membrane on the vesicular trafficking. Uh, and it's just more detail about that, the sequence, and where you get all kinds of uh, post-translational modification of these proteins. And geronial geronilation is definitely an important one. Now, what's the upshot here? Geronial geronial pyrophosphate, where does it come from? It comes from the cholesterol genesis pathway. Does it come from cholesterol? Uh, no. Cholesterol is downstream from this. It's only C20, right? You need that as a substrate precursor, in a way, for a lot of complex steroids, but not making it from cholesterol. You don't break down cholesterol and make this. It doesn't happen that way, okay? This is the chain shortening method, like in fatty acid oxidation. No, sorry. So you need de novo cholesterol genesis. So diet have an effect? No. Doesn't matter how much cholesterol you take in. What does have an effect? What about an inhibition of de novo cholesterologenesis? What do we have that's being used quite often? Statins. So statins are gonna decrease that amount of geronal geronal pyrophosphate if they're used at high enough doses and concentrations. Now again, they're gonna do that because we know that's what will happen, that is precursor product relationships. Whether or not that's a physiological or pathophysiological sequelae or consequence to taking chronic statins is still sort of not well described. Okay? But we are beginning to see where chronic statin use does seem to implicate certain metabolic disorders. One of the things that seems to be possibly implicated are metabolic disorders. And that's what this paper is kind of looking at, right? Insulin resistance associated with obesity associated type 2 diabetes. That's what we're going back to. So remember this. You need this geronial geronilation here blocked by statins in order to convert this GDP RAB, getting rid of this dissociation complex, getting the exchange factor, that's GAF, to make the active GTP. And what's this guy going to do? He's going to go and take the GLUT4 to the uh, get that vesicular trafficking going. It's only one thing they do. They do lots of other things. Okay, So very myopically, for just this brief discussion, he understands what it's doing. And then, of course, it cycles back, right? Uh, you get rid of the GTP, you get GDP, you're sequestered. And what it takes then to get to being active again is the geronial geronial transferase. That's what that enzyme is, GGT. What do you need for that? You need geronial geronial pyrophosphate. Where do you get that? Isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Where do you get that? Mevalonic acid pathway. Where do you get that? HMG-CoA. You need to go through HMG-CoA reductase, which is inhibited competitively by statins. Got it. Okay, so let's take a look at this story now. Okay, it's going to get more nuanced, but again, we're talking to um, peers here. This is an equivalent conversation, so I know that you know these terms. So skeletal muscle, of course, is a metabolic tissue regulating glucose and lipid homeostasis, as we've been saying, we're all aware of. Glucose uptake requires an intact insulin signaling because it's glucose-dependent, uh, glucose up, uh, insulin-dependent glucose uptake, and that induces the translocation of GLUT4, as we've shown. A dysregulation of skeletal muscle lipid metabolism has been linked in the literature, there's lots of evidence for this, with insulin resistance. 
And that's potentially caused by an excess accumulation of intramuscular bioactive lipids. So what are the bioactive lipids? Three kinds, diacylglycerol, okay, diacylglycerol formed from triacylglycerol after a lipase reaction. GAG turns on protein kinases. It's also quite hydrophobic. Um, not only that, and it's also a precursor to phospholipids. Ceramide, which is an N-linked fatty acyl sphingolipid, which is associated with programmed cell death, something I discussed in one of my previous Vera of Med lectures. Very interesting topic, important in cancer, progression of cancer, progression of apoptosis versus autophagy, for example. And all of that, just those bioactive lipids, are going to interfere with insulin signaling because insulin receptor needs to make it to the membrane. And all those other, the IRS and the uh, phosphonostal 1-3 uh, uh, kinase reaction, all of those proteins need to have an intact membrane carrying out all this foundational, ontological foundational biochemistry and molecularity. And where does that come from? That comes from being able to discharge its duties. And if you have bioactive lipids, that's changed particularly ceramide, causes major changes in membrane dynamics, and so does diacylglycerol, just by making it in the membrane. Okay. The third one not shown here that I'm telling you is also the dark horse in the pathway are just free fatty acids. The accumulation of free fatty acids in skeletal muscle cells is not the same as having IML, intramuscular lipid, which is in the form of a droplet, which has perilipins around it, which is a canonical pathway to utilize fatty acids for beta oxidation to generate ATP for muscle contraction and skeletal muscle aerobic pathways, okay? So free fatty acids embedded in membrane or moving through the cytoplasm are not the same as IML. They're not triacylglycerol. And so those free fatty acids need to be sopped up, need to make acyl coas out of them. And as you might guess, an excessive amount of fatty acid, which can occur when you have disruptions in insulin signaling in skeletal muscle and in other tissues like adipose, of course, could mean a corruption of the insulin receptor itself, a corruption in beta oxidation of fatty acids and a corruption in, in glucose import, all of which look like what? Diabetes and various pathologies around diabetes, metabolic syndrome, stroke associated metabolic syndrome, um, and of course, obesity linking to all of that because of the highest level of circulating lipids in the blood in obese patients. That's, that's a mouthful, but that's where we're getting at here, okay? So intramuscular lipid accumulation is attributed to an excess of cell surface fatty acid transporters. So the way you get a lot of lipid accumulation is you get a lot of transporters. What are these things called? CDC36 and uh, FAT1, okay? Those are the two major translocators of lipids into skeletal muscle. Now that can lead to a lot of excess fatty acid transport, for example, from LDL, right? Via lipase activity. Now, if you get too much, just like with anything, you're gonna start endocytosing those receptors. So you're gonna get less incorporated. But what else happens? Too much fatty acid into the muscle tissue that's being translocated via thioester linkage from acyl coase to acyl carnitin back to acyl coase into the mitosol, the mitochondria for beta oxidation where that happens and occurs. You get a buildup of fatty acids. You can't charge those thioesters sufficiently. You can't charge those thioesters. What happens? You get an accumulation of the free fatty acid, which again is toxic, okay? That's, that's the toxicity. Lipotoxicity is free fatty acids. Very dangerous stuff, okay? All right, so you, if you get an impairment of beta oxidation, why would that happen? Well, beta oxidation is an interesting pathway. And give me a second just to tell you. So you got very long chain fatty acids, let's say palmitate which is really very long, but it's a standard C16 fatty acid, saturated fatty acid. So that's coming in, right? And that's going to be knocked down two carbons at a time through the canonical beta oxidation pathway, right? Uh, utilizing hydrases and uh, um, dehydrogenases to carry out the uh, three-step removal of two carbon units from preformed fatty acid to make acetyl-CoA. The beta oxidation yields. Now, what are you getting besides acetyl-CoA after each round of beta oxidation? You're getting chain-shortened fatty acid. The chain-shortened fatty acids are going to competitively, com they're going to compete with the long-chain fatty acid, which is coming in, which is mobilized and moving in and moving in more and more and more in this pathophysiological state, such as obesity, right? Such as insulin resistance, right? So when you get that, you get a competition between the long-chain fatty acid and short-chain fatty acid. What happens? Beta-oxidation shuts down. 
shuts down. You're not burning those fatty acids anymore. You're not getting that extra ATP from that. So you're corrupting normal basal oxidative, oxidative metabolism in those muscles that prefer to use fatty acids. You're also, of course, corrupting that glucose uptake because of GLUT4, right? If you're also involved in inhibiting or altering the statin pathway, via statins, the cholesterol genesis pathway. Now, cholesterol genesis also requires HMG-CoA, which comes from acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA, where is that coming from? Well, the acetyl-CoA to make cholesterol, because that would be a biogenetic biogen mo mode, would be coming from citrate. Citrate's going to leave the TCA cycle in the mitochondria, ATP citrate lice. You're going to make acetyl-CoA, which is used for fatty acid synthesis or prenolipid synthesis. So what happens with that is you're going to decrease the ability to be able to go through that pathway, right? You're going to diminish that because you're going to be flooding with all these acyl coas in the mitochondria. So you're going to be shutting down those pathways. Shutting down those pathways means less precursor to make even the prenal lipids. So again, even without statin use, the obesogenic state is going to corrupt insulin uh, receptivity because it's going to corrupt fatty acid oxidation, which then in legion with glucose uptake decrease is going to give you the frank type 2 diabetes, right? So evidence that improvements in skeletal muscle beta oxidation can improve insulin sensitivity are abound everywhere in the literature. So if you can increase that amount of fatty acid utilization, you're in better shape in skeletal muscle. You're removing that lipotoxic environment. You're making a lot of acetyl-CoA, which is going to be ultimately uh, used to make to generate ketone bodies. Ketone bodies can also be used as energy, right? You can go back out into the blood. But likewise, you're going to be making a lot of uh, NADH and FADH2, uh, and that ultimately is going to be able to link to gluconeogenesis or sparing of glycogen in those muscle fibers that store a lot of glycogen into glucose oxidation. So all of this is also to do with muscle fatigue, muscle wasting like in diabetics. It's all linked. Right? Again, too much information to describe for one talk, but you get you get where these can be linked. Now, finally, let's talk about this protein, okay. TBC1D1, okay? So that's Trey Bubba CDC1, okay? I know, terrible. Trey proteins, Bubba proteins, and CDC proteins. I'm not kidding. So I know these proteins have terrible names. See, I think proteins are named much worse than lipids. I think lipids sound cooler, and I think they often – they sort of are mnemonic for what lipids do, right? Like fatty acids, you know what they do. But TBC1D1, I mean, give me a break. Or even if you break it down, bubble proteins? I mean, I don't even want to go there. All right. Anyways, that's what that means if you look it up, uh, uh, the antigenics of that, uh, that protein. So it's been named. It's been described. Now, what does it do? Why am I talking about it? Here we go. It's actually a potential molecular regulator of glucose and lipid metabolism. Yeah, since mutations in that protein. So how do we even know that? Because looking around, what's mutated in, say, the obesogenic uh, cell? What's mutated in the diabetic cell? What's mutated in the fatty acid oxidation inhibition pathways, okay? Well, this protein, well, why would that? Well, what does it do? Can we uh, repair or complement that mutation in cells? Can we get back normal physiological state? It's the kind of studies that are done in cells and in animals first and then ultimately in humans. And that's what's been done with this guy, right? Mutations in it. So they're associated with obesity. Mutations in that protein associated with these. And, whoa, insulin resistance. They go hand in hand in humans uh, uh, many times, right? All right. Now, what is the protein? Well, as it turns out, it's actually part of this GTPase uh, consortium or family of proteins, right? It's part of the RAB gap family of proteins. And it is uh, regulated by AMP kinase and AKT signaling, okay? It's also mediated by insulin, and it's also mediated by muscle contraction, which is very important in skeletal muscle, and by this nucleotide intermediate ACARE, which is actually used um, as pharmacotherapy for some types of diabetes. Okay. So, wow. Okay. So all of those seem to be regulated to this TBC1D1. It seems to be intimately involved in all this metabolic signaling, which in turn is associated with oxidation of glucose and fatty acid, which also coheres with insulin resistance. So it's got to be a major player. How? No, let's try to figure this out. TBC1D1 is a negative regulator of fatty acid oxidation, full stop. 
negative regulator. So reductions in TBC1D1, as well as this particular mutation here, at, uh, that's a 125, right? It's arginine uh, mutation, increases the rates of fatty acid oxidation in these cells and in skeletal muscle, respectively. So the mutations found actually in animals, that increases beta oxidation when you have the mutation. So that's a positive effect in a way. Um, but just having a reduction in the protein also gets you more beta oxidation, at least in the cell lineage. So that's interesting. So it definitely looks like a negative regulator of fatty acid oxidation. So what's going on here? Let's put this together. TBC1D1 content differs among tissues. Remember, we we're talking before about glucose oxidizing versus lipid oxidizing. We're back to it, okay? You get more of this protein in skeletal muscle than anywhere else, this particular protein. So this isn't your... This isn't found in all GTPase motors, only in some motors, and particularly in skeletal muscle. Okay? Remember, skeletal muscle is really important for fuel economy, fuel homeostasis, glucose and lipid, and that is, of course, a hallmark of the obesogenic diabetic paradigm in pathophysiology. Right? So that's why it's so intri intriguing and important. So TBC1D1 protein is more abundant, in fact, in the glycolytic, and, uh, glycolytic muscle tissue than in the oxidative. Interesting, right? So it seems to be more profoundly important in there. Now, we already know that GTPases regulate GLUT4 translocation to the plasma membrane. Since this is a GTPase adapter type protein, it looks like that all makes sense, right? This protein, the more it is, you're going to have more of it in glycolytic oxidizing muscle cells because you're going to need more of the mobilization of GLUT4 to that membrane to bring in more glucose because you're going to prefer glucose oxidation in those cell types with less mitochondria because of less gene expression to generate mitochondria and generate the enzymes in, inside mitochondria, oxidative phosphorylation, beta oxidation, uh, amino acid, transamination, things like that. Um, so it looks like that makes sense, right? It looks like it would not be high abundant in fatty acid oxidizing muscle cells, and indeed it's not. Okay. So, but it would be very susceptible to changes in fatty acid oxidation because once you turn the switch and you can turn the switch, you can start making more mitochondria because mitochondria reproduce by vision, right? So you start making more mitochondria, you're going to start uh, putting inside those mitochondria all of the expression of the genes that come from both the nucleus and the mitochondrial genome to make oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport enzymes and proteins, uh, as well as all the component lipids like coenzyme Q right, um, for the Q cycle. And you're also, of course, then going to get beta oxidation of fatty acids because you have more mitochondria. All of those enzymes have to be um, generated that is expressed at the transcription translation level to be incorporated in the mitochondria for them to be functioning correctly. So a subtle change then can give you a big change in oxidizing between glucose fatty acid. And maybe this protein plays a role there. Seems to be linked anyway. So the basis for altering fatty acid oxidation of skeletal muscle is explained by the coordinate alterations of genes involved. And I just told you, mitochondrial fission, oxfos, electron transport, fatty acid oxidation. Now, all of that is controlled by the peroxidome proliferator activator receptor system uh, with the adapter molecule PGC1-alpha. Okay. So that's turning on beta oxidation. That's kind of counter to, say, protein synthesis in cells, right? This is burning down lipids to get energy, right? And that's what all of this is. More mitochondria, more oxfos, more ET, that's electron transport, more beta oxidation. These cells are going to be burning fats, and that's what you want generally because we're oligenous organisms and want to be able to utilize all that fat restored. So there's a protein-mediated fatty acid transport in muscles that's highly regulated, as you need to ask. And of course, we're going to say, yes, that's right. And it contributes to the regulation of fatty acid oxidation because this transport is co-associated with acyl-CoA synthase. Okay? So among the various fatty acid transporters, I told you the fat protein, love that name, CD36, the other is another name for fat receptors. They appear to be key and central to fatty acid oxidation. And indeed, associated with those translocating proteins <clears throat> is an acyl CoA synthase. So the fatty acids have delivered, say, from LDL, the sterified to coenzyme A and metabolic play. Remember, you go from CoA ester in the cytosol, you have to activate that fatty acid, to carnitine ester as you're moving through the membrane of the mitochondria, and then back to CoA ester for beta oxidation. 
So what can we say about this? How do we put this together? Now, I'm not going to go into the whole in-depth paper or the papers. I'm just going to give you these concluding remarks because we're done here. TPC1E1 affects the activity of an enzyme called beta had. Now that's part of the beta oxidation pathway. That's the hydroxyacyl CoA dehydrogenase, right? That's the dehydrogenase part of the pathway, right? That's taking the um, hydroxyl form of the fatty acid after you hydrated the fatty acid, right? You get the hydroxylated form, and then what happens, right? You make the keto function. How do you make the keto function? You go from the OH to the keto function. You get rid of the hydrogen. That's why it's called dehydrogenase. That's like the last step in beta oxidation, okay? Three steps, general steps, if you're not counting the activation of the coaster. Okay, so that's really important. Wow, look at that. It affects the activity of that enzyme. In fact, a reduction in that enzyme results in a reduced rate of fatty acid oxidation. That's absolutely clear. Without that enzyme functioning, you're not going to get fatty acid oxidation. It's going to block it at the hydroxyacyl level. As it turns out, TBC1D1 alters the protein content of beta hat. So somehow it's working way back at the transcriptional level, maybe through that PGC1 alpha, maybe through the um, alteration of the AKT pathway versus AMP kinase pathway. This leads further study. But clearly, the expression of the beta hat is decreased when you have high levels of TBC1D1. And that makes sense. Remember, TBC1D1, you're making glycoglucose oxidation, right? It's glycolytic in those muscle fibers. So you've got high levels of that. You're going to suppress fatty acid oxidation. What do you suppress? The expression of the whole suite of genes, including the beta oxidation enzymes, including the beta hat, right? Hydro the hydroxyacyl dehydrogenase. That all kind of fits together pretty sensibly. Now, is this a transcription factor? Not likely. Is it regulating a phosphorylation cascade, which then turns on a transcription factor nucleus? Much more likely. Okay. So what this study did was identify TPC1D1 as a targeted mitochondria that is reduced comparably, and this paper was about 18%, with a reduction of fatty acid oxidation, which is also linear with the reduction in the expression of that protein. When that protein is overexpressed, you get less beta oxidation. So future studies are going to be needed to sort all this out. But now we can do something right now. This is the end. What does all this have to do with statins? Why did I bring all the way around to this? Remember, testosterone, statins. Right. Here we go. Rab GTP aces require that geronial geronilation. For correct sorting to the plasma membrane, a decrease in that prenylation will increase insulin resistance by de decreasing GLUT4 mobilization. That's insulin resistance, right? Insulin is impacting its receptor. It's saying, turn on the IRS, turn on the PO13 kinase, turn on all these pathways to bring in GLUT4. But guess what? It can't. Why can't it do it? <laughs> because you're not getting the correct mobilization of the GTPase to coordinate the movement of the GLUT4 to the membrane, right? So you got insulin binding, but you cut off it, so you get resistance to the signaling, right? You get insensitivity to the insulin. Pancreas starts kicking out more and more insulin. What happens to type 2 diabetics? Eventually, it burns out. You can't make more, many more insulin. You're really into the latter stages of type 2 diabetes, right? Yeah. So that lack of geronial geronilation, as potentiated by the statin, potentiated, not causal, potentiated, will cause a buildup of free, that is non-protein associated, because this is a co-associated protein with the GTPase machinery, this TBCD1B1. When it does that, it's going to enhance inhibition of fatty acid oxidation, thus contributing to fatty acid accumulation and further dysregulation of oxidation, and therefore the frank diabetic state. Okay, so that's take-home message. Here. Now, can statins have this effect directly, or is this just regular pathophysiology from obesity? Well, there's the question. So if we can dig into the literature, we can ask those questions. But remember, this isn't the kind of thing that's getting regularly studied. Okay, For one thing, it's very complicated. For one thing, you need bio another thing, you need biopsies, at least of muscle tissue. And just looking at serum biomarkers isn't going to get you there, right? You need to look at actual real-time biological activity. So maybe something like C13 uh, mass spectroscopy, uh, looking at preformed lipids, preformed glucose maybe, and looking at the mobilization, utilization of the C13 
doing mass spectroscopy, isoptimer uh, type of uh, research may get us a better handle in human studies. That might be something that could be uh, suggested. Okay, but clearly this uh, DBC T, uh, TBC protein, right? This Trey Bubba CDC protein seems to have a negative impact of fatty acid oxidation when the GTPase is not geronilated because then you get this associated complex and you get more of this potentially not acting as this transcription factor or as this indirect transcription factor and therefore blocking out the production of more mitochondria, more oxidative phosphorylation, less beta had, less beta oxidation, more fatty acid accumulation. So we're back to this. Block this, you block all these pathways. The one we were talking about was geronial geronilation. Again, does this have a direct impact on all these pathways? Well, certainly at the level of reasoning and at the level of a lot of good evidence that can be verified, yes. But does the chronic utilization of statins have a chronic impact on this pathway? That needs to be studied. That's still a huge question mark in the research literature. It's something I think um, we'll see more and more of as people start looking at chronic use of statins, because this is a generation of people that basically are using them at such high levels, highly prescribed drug. Thank you very much for your attention. I know it was a very long talk, but hopefully I went through the three levels, the um, normal client, the graduate student, medical student client, and then the peer client. Um, my name is Dan Guerra. There's my uh, website, uh, along with my uh, cooperator, who is a registered pharmacist. We deliver to you this sort of interloc interlocution from the scientific literature at these multiple levels. I'll be glad to work with you. Um, there's my email. And thanks a whole lot for your attention.